All right, we have another Perceptive Podcast here on the Game Wisdom channel. As always, I am Josh Blaser, and we have another great discussion about game design plan today. My guest is a returning guest as well as game economist, Ramin Shokazad. And it's been a very long time, I think, since we last spoke. How are you doing? Great. Yeah, I apologize that I, I got very busy when I got here uh, at uh, in, in Australia working on a uh, new tech for uh, blockchain game design and uh, and then starting some new projects. So I apologize for that. That is all right. It's been, in terms of how long it's been, I think the last time we spoke was like, right, like there's no uh, uh, COVID in the world. It's, you know, that nice peaceful time many years ago when we last had our conversation. Yeah, I think it was literally just weeks before I, I flew to, uh, with all my stuff to Australia. <laughs> But it's great to talk with you again for our discussion tonight. We're going to be catching up about mobile games, mobile design, as well as what Ramin is up to. So I guess to begin with, uh, what have you been up to since we last spoke in terms of like your projects and such? Um, I flew out here to uh, Sydney and uh, completed the metagame design and economy for Gods Unchained at Immutable, and then worked on some unannounced projects and developed a lot of blockchain game design theory because there hasn't really been a lot of, like, so far, most of the work in the space has been fairly simplistic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I parted ways with Immutable, and I began uh, work on two projects. Uh, one is uh, Live Hive, which is uh, a means of gamifying and providing games for businesses to help promote their, their brands, uh, which is potentially a pretty big thing. Uh, and the other thing I'm working on, uh, which I'm real passionate about, is a, a new, very large, as far as massive multiplayer, and a highly social, um, ultra-premium game called Cloudwalker. <clears throat> mm which I, I liken to as sort of like uh, um, the luxury version, the luxury adult version of Pokemon Go. <laughs> All right, and uh, we'll, I'll try to get some information out of you about that later on in this discussion. Uh, question from chat, uh, what is blockchain game design? Okay, blockchain allows you to securely trade two things, uh, trade things between two, two people. Uh, the neat thing about blockchain is for a transaction to proceed, everything has to be authenticated and available, and then everything is done simultaneously. If anything is not where it should be or, or what it should be, then the whole transaction is terminated. So this allows you to trade things, potentially very expensive things, in games where before you'd wonder if you were going to get what you paid for, if you were going to get ripped off. That just, that just can't happen with blockchain. Mm -hmm. So this, this opens the door to uh, what I describe as like ultra-premium transactions. Uh, and, and these transactions don't have to include the developer at all. They can occur completely between players. Uh, presumably, if you know what you're doing when you design these games, you're actually promoting that. You're promoting these interplayer trades, what, I, what I've described as RMT, uh, RMT2 in, in some of my papers in the, in the past, which is like mm -hmm. trades between expert players. Okay. Uh, this, this, this opens the door to much larger games, uh, much larger asset transfers, uh, some very expensive things, and, and trying to figure out what it is that would make something expensive in a game is a lot of what I've been working on last year. Mm. And yeah, and that's something a discussion we can have a little bit more in depth tonight as well about, you know, getting that value or putting a price on content in games like this. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, just putting a price tag on something doesn't make it valuable. It, yeah. it, it has to be perceived as valuable by the buyer. Mm -hmm. And we had a miniature discussion about kind of like mobile design on our Sunday show with Shark. And we are we are oh, referencing okay. your name several times during that. We wanted to get you on for that discussion, too. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, you, you, you had me check out a couple games, and I did, so I've got feedback on those. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I, I found them both interesting, but also lacking in certain areas. Yeah. And before we move on to that, like, continue with your discussion or with your uh, work with blockchain. So, like, from your base description, it's kind of reminding me a little bit of, like, the next step from something like Second Life which uh, Second Life obviously allowed players to basically be their own stores and buy and mm -hmm. sell and obviously not only transfer premium real money to premium currency, but premium currency back to real money as well. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of like almost like a basic idea of like what you're going for? Yeah, I mean, in the past, uh, going all the way back to my case, when I was selling game assets and EverQuest going back to 1989, the, the most crit and then later in, in EVE Online in 2003, the most important thing uh, back when we were using eBay and such for trades was reputation. Players had to know that you had a good enough reputation that you would always deliver what you said you were going to mm -hmm. deliver. And then people felt comfortable working with you. Uh, <clears throat> as IG took over the the trading space there were a lot of hackers a lot of stolen assets uh a lot of um you know uh, just shady things going on and people didn't always know if they were going to get what they're but they were paying for or maybe they were buying stolen goods hacked goods yep. and and then their account would get banned uh after they made the transaction uh which is actually worse than if they hadn't done the transaction at all um so there needs to be a new way of doing this uh and instead of developers just saying, no, you can't have any sort of real money transactions in our game, instead having uh, developers encouraging that and working that into the game because mm -hmm. trade is actually a, a very strong attractor uh, for gamers. They really enjoy being able to, <clears throat> to earn and trade things in game. Yep, definitely. And yeah, like you said about developers like trying to like push in that space like we go we, if we look at it a few years ago with diablo 3 for instance and when they start mm -hmm. with the whole auction house and go even further back with world of warcraft the auction house system and mm -hmm. there's always been like several issues with that as you said one of them being you know the trust factor how do i know what i'm getting is real and that led to i was as you're well aware i'm sure as my audience a whole you know gold mining gold farming uh, schemes and such that happened in the mid thousands and then the other aspect of this is whether or not the game is designed fully to take advantage of that or to take advantage of the player base because for anyone who remembers diablo 3 the game was notoriously designed to force you to use the auction house like the game was made intentionally difficult, intentionally frustrating in terms of loot generation, so that the stuff that was really good was so good that you had to spend money or get really lucky, or if you didn't get that, you were basically just like worthless at the high level of playing Diablo three. And well, that, no, go ahead. As you may as you may recall, uh, when I found out they were going to use a real money uh, auction house in Diablo three, I published a paper six months before the game came out and before I'd even seen the game, in fact, I've, I've still never seen Diablo three, uh, uh, predicting in detail, everything that was going to go wrong with Diablo three through the first year after launch, everything I predicted came true. Um, and even though I published that and I assumed that people at Blizzard read my stuff, they ignored my warnings and went ahead with it. And that ended up not working out very well for them. Yeah. And, that also led into, I think, an issue I'm sure you thought about. I know uh, Shark and Chet, he's working on his own uh, uh, deck builder and style game with his own, going to have his own economy system with that, is the idea of getting the player to trust that to begin with. Because, uh, and we'll talk about some of the mobile games that we both had a chance to play in the next few minutes. The problem is that whenever you have real money um uh, purchases or real money transactions in these games players are very especially like hardcore and core gamers they're very skeptical as to whether or not you know it's actually worth it because like we've said like a lot of early mobile games were designed to appeal to non-gamers the people who didn't grow up playing these games and knowing you know the tricks and the tactics that goes into them for us like when we see you know anything that has a dollar a sign or a dollar currency next to it, we go, we're going to look at that with a fine-tooth comb to make sure 
is this actually going to help me or is this just a scam trying to get my money? Well, I mean, I'm potentially a whale on games. I, I've spent over $1,000 a year in some games that I enjoy. But generally, uh, I don't spend money in games or I don't spend more than maybe like $10 in a, in a free-to-play game because usually what they're asking you to do is pay for something that will progress you through the game, which will actually undermine the progression system, which is what keeps you glued to the game. And actually... I know uh, that, that my enjoyment of the game will actually be decreased if I spend money. Uh, which, so why would I want to spend money? Now, a player, most, your general player may not realize this at first. They'll spend money thinking that'll make their gameplay experience better. And then they just enjoy the game less and don't understand why. Yep. And... But, the, but this, is, this doesn't help your business model because this just reduces your, the lifespan of your product. Yeah, but that's what the, uh, Shark and I talked about on our Sunday show, that when we look at kind of the mobile market as a whole over the last decade, many of the games were very much anti-consumer, or more specifically, anti-free-to-play. They want you to spend that money or get stuck in that content. And it led to a lot of these games being designed around, yes, there's two to three years of content if you don't spend a dollar and you grind endlessly. You spend that money, you could probably finish that game in maybe two weeks, a month at most, and then where do you go from there? Yeah, and then if it's a PvP game, you can end the gaming experience for everyone else oh, by yes. zeroing them out within two weeks. Yep, definitely. And, and I know uh, you've had that, I think on one of our first discussions, you talked about one of the mobile games you were playing that... You went, I think, all in or very much all in on like the VIP system where you kind of try to become like the top player in the PvP server and kind of that back and forth that can develop, which developer really loves, you know, when people are competing with their dollars, but it just destroys that community and that system for everybody else. Well, I mean, I recently went back to play, I think it was Ark of War okay. uh, and to see if they had improved it over the years and they're, they've added a lot of content, but really the basic problems the gamers are 100% still there, which were that as soon as I dropped my shield, I had a, uh, I had a uh, high level player just come over and go out of his way to zero me out, even though there wasn't really any value to that player to zero me out, mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure there'd be no competition. And this is this is what I talk about. This is what I've been doing a lot of work in the last years about. Uh, what I call non-competitive activities in competitive games. Uh, it, may, it may look like PvP is a competitive action, but most of the time it's actually non-competitive. You're trying to eliminate all the potential competitors so you can have a comp competition-free environment in a PvP game, which destroys it. Yep. And uh, like we've said, there's so much about kind of the psychology that goes in these games, the psychology of gamers, that most people don't really know, let alone think about. And it's led, I know we were, at one point we are going to have probably have a discussion about, you know, like toxicity and, you know, game studios, or toxicity in general. But there's still so much about, you know, what it means to play these games that I don't think a lot of people really have comprehended. Well, I mean, there's some pretty intense sociology going on here, in addition to psychology. And, uh, Game developers don't tend to be the most social people, and they don't tend to have the really be very sophisticated as far as understanding sociology and how social interactions work. So they're not capable of designing that in their games. A lot of times, they, their games are designed to promote aggressive behavior, and uh, and then players engaging in aggressive behavior. And then the developers will turn around and complain about toxic behavior coming from their players as if it's coming from the players instead of being responsible for having created that themselves. They'll, 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 blame, they'll blame players for the behavior the developer themselves is, is promoting, uh, which I find very frustrating. Yep, and that, again, is kind of like that issue. It's almost, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, uh, it was like the snake eating, it, eating itself or singing its own tail there, that developers complain about, you know, toxic fan base or toxic gamers when the game itself is kind of self to cultivate that and i think 
one of the examples of a developer I, I really don't follow as much to know if they truly have turned it around yet would be like Riot Games of League of Legends. That for a time, League of Legends was considered like the most toxic fan base, toxic culture of gamers like you could find in one place. And I know they try to have done a lot in terms of moderation. I think there's like a tribunal system and etc. But there's still, you know, stories and, you know, lawsuits about Riot Games as a studio itself that we're still, like, hearing, like, almost like on a year-by-year -year basis. Well, again, you know, you have to look at the source. If they, if they have a toxic work environment, it, it does. is it a surprise that they have a toxic game environment? Yeah. They're just, reproduce, they're just reproducing in design what they know. Yeah. And I think, like, to, like, kind of carry this into mobile as well like as you've seen as i'm sure we've all been like playing with a lot of the mobile games or at least the ones that are being marketed they all or for the mo most part they strongly encourage PV uh, pvp play and not only that but you know guild interaction with that pvp play it's not just you have to play this really well you know you're going to get beaten by people but if you're in a guild that guild will say, no, you have to join us for this PvP because we need these resources, and if you don't help us, you know, get out. And we've seen that kind of peer pressure develop in a lot of these titles. Well, I, I, I'm a huge advocate of, of peer pressure. I think uh, what are called peer effects are a huge motivator for people to, to yep. be retained in the game and a huge motivator for them to spend, along with something I call peacocking effects, where you get to show off. Oh, to yes. your fellow players, your abilities, or your your assets, uh, but uh, it, most of the environments you're talking about are in what we would call an open world game, where you have your team basically has freedom to hunt out and attack other players mm -hmm. at will. And again, you get this this toxic environment where one team will just try to wipe out mm -hmm. other teams, and uh, uh, like. Um, State of Survival I played recently, uh, an open world game, uh, where you basically can spend an unlimited amount and become have an unlimited amount of power depending on how much you want to spend. And and players will rapidly just wipe out all the other, other players. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can see there's um, there's over a thousand servers in that game. Because once one team is basically zeroed out everyone else, competition ends in the game and then spending ends because there's no point in spending. Uh, and so they the, the, the process just starts over with a new server. People jump in and think, oh, it's a new server. I have a chance. Uh, I can mm -hmm. actually enjoy playing the game until, until I get zeroed out yeah. uh, for a little bit. And, and, uh, but they all, it all, the whole process just repeats because the, the game literally promotes you mm -hmm. killing their server. Yep. The developers are, 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 are begging you to kill their own server. Mm -hmm. And... Like you said, that cycle just keeps going on and on in a lot of these titles. And again, it punishes free-to-play players or it turns them into, I think you use the term, you call them bait or, you know, the target for a lot of these games. And The, the feeder fish. Yep. For the whales. Or for the shark in chat there. <laughs> but, right. <laughs> but like we've said, like this is, I think, one of those big things. I know we've talked about this before with just how sustainable these games are and we've seen over the last decade that the majority of these mobile games don't last you get the few you know kings you know clash of uh, clash of clans uh, angry birds uh what was it clash royale farmville like those cells that become like the major names and everybody else just kind of you know just fades into the mist after like a few months or a year well, a lot of that has to do with uh, the platform providers. They they charge so much yep. in order to put your game on the platform uh, that it's just pretty much impossible. Uh, the 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 games that are already established, the reason they're they're successful isn't the quality of the game. It's just that uh, the the platform has favored them by giving them free advertising. Uh, so the user acquisition costs are much lower than they are for newer games. And newer games actually need lower user acquisition to get started because no one knows who they are. So you're, you're killing off the new potentially promising entries into the field and you're favoring the old ones, which 
by and by aren't particularly high quality. They just persist because of lack of competition. And to build off of that, I guess I have two questions for you then about like general like mobile related. The first one, you mentioned, of course, going back to the game that you played a long time ago. Like in the mobile scene, are there any examples of games that have matched to either turn things around as, you know, a complete redesign or games that have managed to survive thanks to constantly changing? Or is it very much a case of... I would say no. Yeah. And the reason, the reason this doesn't happen is because the mantra, the, the generally accepted wisdom in the major mobile game developers today is data-driven design. Mm -hmm. And data-driven design means you, you don't do anything unless the data suggests that it's, it's safe or appropriate to do. And that means you don't do anything you haven't already done because you don't have any data on things you haven't done. Mm -hmm. So this data-driven design is great for iteration, but kills innovation. So you're not seeing the innovation described because data-driven design is considered the, you know, the, the gospel in mobile today. Yeah. And then I guess the, the second part of that question, I know when we first did our conversation, we talked about how for a lot of mobile games, they're trying to keep somebody playing for at least two weeks, like 15 days they're about to get them invested in the game. For like some like the bigger name or some of the more popular examples, is there like a accepted time frame for like how long they're in business in order to like call them you know, a genuine success in the mobile market? Um, not that I know of, and I don't really know what the you know they may be persisting, but I don't know how much of that's actually turnover or how much is staying power. Yeah, I mean. I uh, mean, you know, the 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 two games I I meta designed for war gaming, uh, that I uh, World of Tank Splits, which is mobile, and World of Warships, which is not mobile. Uh, I designed both of those in early 2014, and they're both still going strong, but they were designed to be long tail games. You know, to to engage players over years and have players spending over years, and they were successful in that regard, but that's generally not how games, other games seem to be designed. Yeah, and I think that's a good segue into kind of talking a little bit more about uh, your thoughts on modern mobile design and kind of what you've been seeing as well. And uh, for the chat, if you have any questions for us about these topics, please let us know in the comments. So to kind of kick off the section, I uh, gave Ramin a small list of some of the mobile games I've had a chance to play. Stuff like Ark Knights, Illusion Connect, Genshin Impact. I may have mentioned Guardian Tales, I'm not sure. That was another one that I had a chance to try out. And, like, for myself, like, again, with everyone being stuck inside these last... Feels like it's been, like, a few years now, but for over this course of this year, I've been playing more of these mobile games to kind of, like, see what's been going on with it. And... It does seem like some of like the newer examples are going in different directions, maybe almost by necessity compared to what we saw four or five years ago. Well, there's there's definitely some new things being tried. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, uh, but with mixed results, and and no one's really hitting it because they don't. Uh, I I don't know. My my belief is that there's just core tenants of game design theory that are not understood by these teams or, or, or having been in these teams myself a lot of times just because someone's telling them to do stuff that they may know is not going to work but they don't have the authority to to say no to this person mm -hmm. yeah and it is kind of interesting to see like where these games have gone like um, I guess let's start with like the big name example, and that would be Genshin Impact. That this was a game that for like console and PC audiences, they had no idea what this game was. Like it just appeared, you know, out of the blue one day. For the mobile scene, I know mobile uh, mobile sites, mobile YouTubers, and streamers have been talking about this game for months, and it was officially released. I want to say mid September, and people are still talking about this. It seems to be very much the, you know, 
big budget, you know, cross platform mobile game. And I played it like the first week, maybe like a week and a half, and I kind of got tired of it. And I want to get your thoughts onto it because I think what you just said there about, you know, trying something new but either not understanding the whole process or not being able to, you know, fix what's broken is kind of hamstringing some of these uh, modern mobile games. Well, when I was saying that, I was thinking probably primarily of Genshin Impact. Yeah. Uh, I mean, clearly, along with Eve Echoes, it's uh, an attempt to bring a really high-end uh, PC-type open-world game into mobile and, and, and retain that, that graphic quality uh, and that freedom of movement, which I think is... Uh, is fairly amazing. Uh, it's and, and it makes for great uh, videos, trailers, maybe even YouTube videos, but mm. it doesn't make for a good game, unfortunately. And and the reasons may be a little bit subtle. Uh, the one of the main things is that is these types of games require a hundred percent immersion, mm. just like their PC equivalents. And, and that's not what mobile is for. Mobile is, the advantage of mobile is you can take it anywhere and do it anytime. Mm -hmm. But you, you can't do, you can't take advantage of any of those advantages of mobile if you have to be 100% immersed. If you're on a bus, you're going to, you can miss your bus stop. You, you could get mugged if you're in the United States on the bus and not paying attention. Uh, um, and if you're trying to walk around, you could get hit by an, you know, a vehicle or, or anything. Many things could go wrong if you're trying to be 100% immersed. You, you just can't do it when you're walking around on a mobile device. So I, I really couldn't play Genshin Impact while walking, for instance. It, it just requires too much concentration, especially if I'm in a battle. Those battles really seem to require you to do a lot of kiting. Very uh, great mental labor intensive. Uh, I would get fatigued rapidly trying to play that game, so I wouldn't be able to play it as much as I normally play in a day. Um, this all re reduces the utility of the game to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Let's see, this, this is why you see auto battlers are, are very po are becoming very popular in mobile games, and, and appropriately so because that's one way that you can reduce the amount of immersion but still keep the player engaged. Yeah. And I think, like, even for games that do have, like, more involved gameplay, something like Ark Knight or Zerlane, they still allow you to just go on auto mode after you've cleared yeah. a map or even just playing the game generally, I think for that very reason. And that was one of the things that I noticed with uh, Genshin Impact, like you said, that it's not really, like, an idle or a relaxed game like this is not something that you can play and do something else at the same time especially if you're trying to explore this world and it feels very much like as you said like it feels like almost like in between whether in between you know the mobile design with you know the gotcha impact or the gotcha gotcha focus and trying to be like that next pc or console title that they want you to sit down and play it for two to three hours, you know, just focus on that and not do anything else. Yeah, but why, why not just use a PC for that if that was the case? Yeah. I mean, what's, what's the point? Why, why, yeah, it's, it's amazing you managed to squeeze this onto a mobile device, but why? Uh, the mobile audience isn't going to take full advantage of whatever you just did because you didn't take it, you didn't match the product to the behavior and the consumer needs of your new audience. Yeah. And I was watching uh, one of the more prominent like mobile streamers uh, who was talking about this in terms of the uh, turnover rate of Genshin Impact with a lot of free to player uh, free to play players leaving the game for like the people who came from who came from PC or console to play Genshin Impact who don't have a mobile background and kind of being hit by a lot of those quirks of mobile design. You know, the grinding, the having to do the daily events, and of course, you know, the incredibly low chance of making progression through their gotchas and their banners. 
I, I didn't, I couldn't even figure out how to even move in Genshin Impact for about five minutes. And then I finally realized that you had to pretend there was like a mouse wheel in the lower mm. left corner, which wasn't even visible and kind of like move your, your thumb up in the, in the lower left corner to, to move forward. Cause I was trying to like tap mm-hmm. on the screen or move like this. It wasn't working. And that's actually, similar movement control to what we had in uh in world of tanks blitz but uh there was no i didn't see anything that that told me i should be doing that so it it, it could be very frustrating to a player that didn't know that that was a way to do things yeah and i played it on the playstation 4 using a gamepad and as somebody who predominantly plays a lot of action-based games, I found that the whole UI to be a little bit on the cumbersome, cumbersome side, trying to make use of it. And I know when they develop it, they design the game explicitly to be, you know, mobile, PC, and gamepad focus. And I think trying to fit all that into one design kind of hurt it from a UI standpoint. I mean, it wouldn't matter if it, if it if it was all more turn-based or more auto battling, but since it's, since it requires uh, you know very precise motor control, especially when you're you're kiting, oh, yes. um, it, it, it makes it a, a, a huge hurdle for play, especially for older players, which I don't think they're like even con- considering involvement mm-hmm. of. But those older players have more money to spend if you can if you can hook them. Uh, they're much more likely to become a whale for you. Yeah. Now, speaking about spending money, what did you think about how they implemented or designed their gotchas and banners? For those of you who are watching or don't know what we're talking about, Genshin Impact features an incredibly low uh, draw percentage for their best stuff. It's at 0.06%, according to what the game you know posts in posts in its notes. Well, I mean, I, I, I read the reviews. A lot of people were complaining about that. But I, I personally didn't really see the, the point even getting that far in the game because, like, your, your main character uh, is, on paper, stronger than this pyro gal that I picked up. <laughs> uh, but the pyro gal is an archer. And if I mm-hmm. want to really, uh, you know, burn a lot of brain cells, I can kite like mad and actually do better with her by avoiding direct combat entirely. But, but that's just so much work. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I suspect a lot of these other characters are a lot of the same thing. It's like, well, you know, yeah, maybe it's, it's stronger or on paper, but the actual implementation might not be that great or it might be just too much work. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I, I don't really, and, and, and in any case, it probably just speeds up the battles a little bit, but it's going to be the same thing. So I don't really know if the, the utility is that high in having a better character. Mm. And I also don't know if there's like group play in that game, because if there isn't, then you're not getting the peacocking effects, which might also save the, the business model. There is multiplayer. I did not do, I don't think I really did anything with it. It's kind of like being like hidden underneath some of like those systems. For myself, I play it to about, I think, Adventure Rank... I want to say 25, 26, somewhere in that level. And it was just really starting to feel like a grind to me in terms of playing that game. And it kind of, I think, falls into some of the similar traps a lot of open world games have. That it's, here's three tasks, now repeat them for the next 40 hours all over the map. And you're just really doing the same thing. It's just maybe you're you know, in a uh, grass environment versus a jungle environment. I mean, a lot of these games are built on Excel. Uh, mm-hmm. That's why they seem to be so fascinated with hiring people that are good at Excel. And and when you play, you can feel like you're playing the Excel spreadsheet. Oh, these are the three items that drop right now. Mm-hmm. And later on, there'll be six items that are just slightly upgraded versions of the previous three items. And those, that's what'll drop. And you're just going through the spreadsheet, you know, mm-hmm. row by row as you play, and uh, uh, it becomes very predictable. Yeah. 
and uh and you know everything is very carefully controlled to make sure they know how long it'll take you to get to each stage and and um i don't know do you want to be that rat chasing that cheese for hours and 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 i and i think it ultimately just comes down to be to fun pain uh mm-hmm. where they they they're intentionally trying to bore you with their game mm-hmm. hoping that if they bore you sufficiently you will become frustrated and spend money to become less bored. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I think that's a very weird way to treat your players against this and anta- player antagonism approach. And uh, and even if it's successful and the player spends, they're just going to experience the same thing over and over again, but on a different row in the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, which means that they could do it again, but then they'll be like, "Oh well, that didn't really help me last time, so why would I do it this time?" Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting point about kind of boring the player into spending money because it's something that, um, and we'll talk a little bit about Arknights next, but a lot of kind of the hero collector gotcha focus kind of games, what I've seen them do is they explicitly save, you know, unique abilities or, you know, special powers for their five or six star characters their ssr or whatever you know high rank you want to describe it as and everybody else does nothing you know the most common characters all they do is just stand there and you know smack a guy with their sword for 20 minutes and one of the issues i had with genshin impact was again that the majority of that gameplay was just me mashing the same button again and again for two hours how long it took me to complete those dailies and if I got one of those five star characters, you know, they're going to do something special or unique. But if I don't get them, you know, what else is there to do in this game other than just mashing that same button again? Yeah, I mean, if you want that level of immersion where you want to completely space out, then maybe there's some value in that. But for somebody like me who I, I, I actually work for a living while I'm playing games and I'm thinking about like, what am I gonna, how am I going to solve this design problem or that? And I'm, I might be gaming while I'm thinking about that. Just, just, just something as a relaxing thing to do. And uh, um, I can't do that if I'm, I'm involved in that level of immersion. If somebody messages me and needs help with this problem or has a question about this, I, I, again, I, I can't do that at the same time. So uh, I pretty much only play turn-based games or, or similar type of things. Because mm-hmm. otherwise they're just uh, they just prevent me from making money, and uh, and that's the money that the developer wants from me. So what do they want me to do? Nothing and not have any money, or do they want me to to be able to play their game while making money so that I can give the money? Yeah, and see about like turn bases on. That's a good uh, segue into Ark Knights and. Arc Knights, I found to be very fascinating. It's the game that I kind of started to get really into before I started playing Illusion Connect, which is kind of the one that I'm doing right now. Mm. And Arc Knights, like, to me, it felt very much like, almost like a next-generation mobile title. Like, that was kind of like the first one that I started to play after I saw playing Marvel Strike Force. And what I found to be very interesting, kind of led to me writing a piece about mobile design, was his idea that there is gameplay to Arknights. Like, it's not just whoever spends the most money automatically wins. And it's something that I found with Illusion Connect as well, and again with Arknights, that, yes, I can, you know, roll the gotcha. I can get that SSR, that six-star character. That doesn't mean anything if I don't know how to play this game or how to organize my teams. And I know uh, Shark and Chat, he's been playing, I think, uh, Bleach Immortal Souls. I think that's the mobile game that he's been playing. And we had a whole discussion about how, you know, he organized his team and set that up. So, like, the commonality is that there, it isn't just a way of, money is not just the answer in these games. It's not... As we were going back, or we were discussing PvP-style games earlier, where money was very much the answer. You know, I spend $500, get the best character or the best gear, I'm the top player on the server. In these games, you spend $500, get SSR characters, if you don't know what you're doing, you're not making progress. 
Yeah, no, I, I really like Dark Knights. I thought that uh, my uh, my personal skill development mattered. The, mm -hmm. uh, uh, trying to figure out how to do this or that. Uh, just having the strongest characters wasn't really necessarily helpful on some maps. You had to mm -hmm. uh, really know how to, like you had to have the proper diversity yeah. and know where to put every unit. Like, uh, like I seem to have a very hard time recruiting support characters. I finally got one support character. Mm -hmm. It's only a three star. Yeah. But I could see it would be so useful to have a support character on these maps who basically just just made for support characters that uh um that i mean i ended up taking that three star and dropping a bunch of resources into it to promote it mm -hmm. uh because uh and it's actually easier to promote a three star than it is a four or higher star yeah. so uh so really there's there's a lot of advantages of a three star over a four or five or even six star i don't really even use my six stars that much because they're their utility is only very limited and kind of more towards the end of a map. And you probably either won or lost the map by the time you even bring it in, in anyway. So that's mm -hmm. the, it's the units I bring in first and almost always like my vanguards that I'm working up the most because I use them the most. They have the most influence on the map. Yeah. Um, so just bigger isn't better in that game. I like that. Yeah. And going back to what I was saying earlier about like Genshin Impact, kind of like having utility uniqueness that, one of the things I really did appreciate, and something I see in Illusion Connect as well, is that while you have, you know, the different classes, when you get to the higher ranks, they have unique uh, quirks and unique abilities on top of it. So one five-star tank is not the same as another five-star tank, or same as a support and so on. So it leads into that kind of advanced thinking. And I came really close to spending money on Arknights, but it started to get frustrating to me to play. So I wanted to ask you, like, were there any cracks in that game's design that you notice? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, just because it's better than the competition doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> it just means it's maybe less bad. I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> extremely polished. It's got fantastic voice acting. I mean, uh, my partner, who is Asian, I mean, she listens to me playing this, and, and, and we're just cracking up at the voice acting because it's, it's so hilarious. Uh, but it's, you know, it's quite good. And, uh, um, uh, you know, so I really appreciate that, and that, that's a nice touch. Uh, so it would make me much more likely to want to spend on the game. But uh, mm -hmm. the way they're trying to encourage spending is they make the game very easy in the beginning so that you feel really strong and it's very easy to, to practice mm -hmm. and stuff. But, but within the first day of play, uh, the, the difficulty is ramped up so far that I can't even complete the maps. So uh, what am I supposed to do in that situation? I'm supposed to say, oh, okay, now I'm, I'm frustrated after 24 hours. Uh, am I supposed to engage in some sort of fun pain loop where I'll spend to reduce the frustration mm -hmm. so that I won't be frustrated until tomorrow? And then I had to spend again. Um, I'm just going to move down the, again, it's just kind of like I'm moving down the Excel spreadsheet a couple rows, but then I'm stuck with the same, exact same, same problem. It's, it becomes less and less, very rapidly, much and less about my skill mm -hmm. and much more about how, it doesn't matter how perfectly I do this map, I'm going to get steamrolled by units I can't even affect. Yeah, and that's what I felt. I got to about, I think, story chapter three or four in that game. And what ended up happening was I had, like, you know, my preferred strategy. You know, I had you know, characters set up a stun or slow them down. Everything was all good. But nobody was able to touch anything because the stats are so... I was so weak in terms of leveling up characters. So even though I had the perfect strategy, it didn't matter if the enemy has, you know, 10 times the health and, you know, 10 times the armor than my guys. So the only option was to spend most of the day just grinding out resources. And yeah. it just got a point yeah. where I was like, it was either that or, you know, cross my fingers and hope I get a perfect six-star character. But then, like we said, that just leads to more grinding because I have to grind that character up so that they're able to do something. Yeah, today I'm like planning on spending 80 or 90% of my energy on the game just grinding XP items so that i can bring the average level of all my operators 
up so that they have some chance against what they're fighting right now. Because mm -hmm. right now it is like the only the only units that, that the units are coming out are such, such high defense that they're literally invulnerable to 80% of my units. The only, the only units that can even affect them are the ones using magic uh, mm -hmm. arts in this game. And, and those characters are the ones with the highest cost to bring into the map. So mm -hmm. by the time you have enough uh, uh, deployment points to bring them in, uh, you probably already lost the game. So you, you need to have, you need to, you need to level up even the units that can't affect your opponents just so that they'll live long enough to buy you time to bring in the ones that can. Mm -hmm. um, that's, yeah. that's, that's a full uh, a grind. And, and, and yeah, I mean, early on, if I had all the six stars, you'd probably get more bang for your buck blowing your XP items on them. Mm -hmm. But again, doesn't that just make the game easier and move you three lines down the Excel spreadsheet before it gets hard again? Yeah. And speaking about Arknights, this is kind of like off topic, but still related. It's something I've been thinking about a lot of the mobile games I've played. That has there been any studies or research on to having these kinds of, I don't know how to describe it, almost like a sub game or a subsystem that kind of is either a distraction or it's there for additional resources. And what I mean by that. In Arknights, you have that whole base building. I'm sure you've unlocked that part. You you know put the various rooms. You put people in there. Um, Azure Lane has a uh, it's kind of like a living room that you build. Illusion Connect has it. Uh, Guardian Tales has a like a Farmville esque uh, grinding area. I guess why do we see so many games have like some kind of you know secondary area or system? Like is it like, is there, like, a design or, like, marketing approach for it? Well, I mean, the more stuff they have for you to do, the figure, the more you'll be engaged. Mm -hmm. And you're less like you're going to get bored. Especially if it's, like, relaxing content. Like, base building is relaxing content. Whereas trying to figure out a, a real-time battle is not relaxing content. So you need to, to uh, you know, give them time to cool off between your, your high-intensity, high-stress activities with something more relaxing. But that... So that I mean, that's all good. the The biggest problem with with Arknights isn't any of the ones we mentioned so far. It's it's that there aren't any pure effects. Without pure effects, uh, what's the point of having cool stuff? Uh, moving three rows down the Excel spreadsheet isn't going to help you at all. But being able to show off your six stars to your friends or your or your teammates that may not be friends, um, that's 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 actually going to going to have more juice for you, um, but then if they know you just bought them, you didn't earn them, then then those pure effects are, may actually turn to toxic effects where they they don't like you because you outspent them. Yeah. Or on the opposite side, if you're playing a PvP focused game. If you don't spend that money, then people are going to look down on you as to you know why are you still using the three star characters? You know we need a full five star team in order to do this raid or fight this other guild, you know, spend yeah. the money or get out. Yeah, or you got zeroed out and you're a goner. Mm -hmm. If and, it's an open world game where they can attack your assets. Yeah. And I guess uh, building off of that, uh, earlier we discussed about this idea of, you know, putting a, giving value to your content, whether it's, you know, value to play or value to pay. And I kind of want to build off of that with what I've been playing with Illusion Connect. Because Illusion Connect right now stands as the record for the most I've spent on a mobile game. And that was $15 for their one-time, like, VIP purchase. And, like, for me, like, from, like, a, a gamer point of view, I saw it as it's $15. It's essentially me buying the game. And I get, you know, weekly summons for free. And it's a lifetime, you know, one-time purchase. And... I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of like lifetime purchases versus, you know, the games that just have that endless spin. And, you know, which one would be more of value for people or gets them to spend money more? Well, I mean, I, I bought the one-year subscription to the Stellaris Mobile hoping that it would be good. Mm -hmm. uh, I like 
those types of long-term subscriptions, but they only work if the game is built to have long-term play. And uh, that Stars game, like many open world games, it's just uh, whoever has the, the most, spends the most, will run around and zero out everyone else. Mm -hmm. And because of the threat generated from that, usually all the players will try to join that person's guild or team. And, and that's, this is what I call an anti-competitive action. Uh, they're all trying to join that team so that they won't have to compete with the people on that team. And then they can just, they have, that team literally had m more power than all the other teams combined on, on the map. And so they could just go out and zero, out, zero anyone at will without any repercussions, without any competition, and then all competition ended. Uh, that's not a competitive game. It's, it's not even interesting. Um, so why play it? So I, I, I didn't even play that more for more than a few weeks, even though I bought the, the long-term subscription. Mm. Overall yeah. games tend to do that. I mean, the, the game I spent the most money on ever was Ways of History. And I got so good that on open world, I could fight 50 players simultaneously to a standstill for months. But, uh, but the thing is, in that game, you get uh, pre-made accounts, like especially the Russians do this. We'll get like 600 pre-made players, uh, meaning they all know exactly who they're going to be teamed with, what they're going to do the first week or two, uh, who they report to. And they just come in and they just zerg everything, like locusts, and just zero out everyone else on the map uh, so that they win the server fairly quickly. And, there's, and that's, again, it's an anti-competitive uh, maneuver. These are 600 players who don't want to compete. So they organize to make sure they can eliminate any competition immediately so that they don't have to compete. But if they're not in that type of game, but they're not competing, they're also not spending. Yep. And that, I think, is another very interesting point about a lot of the PvP center or PvP focus of mobile games. That the ones that I saw, what they often do is they give you the most resources for PvP play, again, to incentivize it. But the problem is if you're so good at PvP that you get all those free resources, you don't need to spend any more money because essentially you're just getting the game for free at that point. Um, yes, but I mean, if, if the game is, is, is about spending, mm -hmm. like, you know, a state of survival, then it really won't matter what your skill level is because if you spend enough money, you can just zero out anybody anyway. And I guess uh, when it comes, to, again, to like putting a price tag on this kind of content, as we said, you've had a chance to play some of the more modern entries. You play a lot of the mobile games as well. Have there been any differing trends or new things in terms of what's popular in terms of monetization in mobile today that compared to what it could have been maybe four or five years ago? Well, I mean, other than the stuff I'm building, no, not really. Uh, and in my case, uh, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't, I haven't been able to convince any of the large studios to work with me. Um, they want to do things the old way. Uh, so I had to go out and seek investors and go through this whole process, which is a lot of additional skill sets I have to develop that are tangential to game design, but I have to do it if I want to go through the process to make a, a game using my methodologies. Um, I have partners, which are fantastic, uh, which make things easier for me. Um, and it takes longer for these things to get, go to the market just because I have to build all that infrastructure instead of it already being ready-made in a AAA studio. But the AAA studios are, um, don't want to try new stuff because they may perceive it as high risk or it's difficult to, to guarantee that it'll be successful. And, and, and to be honest, they don't read my paper, so they don't understand... Uh, the things that have changed in game design over the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and I got my uh, third book on roguelike design coming out next year. I hope developers read that about kind of how to make a good roguelike. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what you just said there is very interesting about still adhering to old monetization models because even with all the, the newer mobile games I played the last few months, I'm still seeing the same things in them from five, six years ago, specifically energy mechanics. Like, even mm. Genshin Impact, despite being this open-world grand game, 
still has energy in the form. I think it's called resin that you need. You get daily, and obviously that's it's a popular system to keep people playing or specifically stop them from playing unless they spend resources. But it's it feels like the industry should have moved away from that. I think at this point, I I actually like energy mechanics for some reasons that are different than the way the way they're used now. But mm -hmm. I, I, I like them to gate access to my game economy. Mm -hmm. But since these games you're talking about don't have game economies, mm -hmm. at best they have what I would call a game budget, which mm -hmm. is all the all the transactions occur between the player and the developer. So that's to my eyes, that's not an economy. Economy is when there's transactions between freely between players. And they don't want this because they fear this. So mm -hmm. they eliminate these economies and replace them with budgets. And in a budget, everything's tightly controlled. So um, in their case, they're just trying to restrict your energy and then charge you for more energy. Mm -hmm. um, I do it because I don't want somebody to just run, to just kill my economy by running a bot 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I forgot to ask you about I want to get your opinion on when it comes to kind of gotcha and banner design today compared to kind of the loot box focus that we saw five years ago and certainly from like AAA developers today. One thing that I see that kind of interests me, and I was talking to Shark about this on our show, is that many of them these days have this idea of quote unquote a pity mechanic. As in, you can spend, you know, X amount of money, get as many rolls as you want. But after, let's say, 70 rolls, 100 rolls, whatever the developer gives you, you get that character for free. Like, there is a guarantee point that you can spend money on these banners and you will just get it. Now, obviously, you know, there's a 0.6% chance, a 2% chance, whatever, you can get it far sooner. But there seem to be designed that there is an intended cap on how much they want somebody to spend on any given banner. And that to me seems different than what we saw from loot box design, where it's just, you know, that endless money sink. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, when, when, when they're, they're, they're mostly posting the, the odds, hopefully accurately, sometimes not. Uh, there's a lot of complaints that in Arc Knights, the posted odds are not accurate and are actually, they're actually worse than what's posted. But the, you know, this movement was forced by regulators that demanded that in Gotcha that they actually post the odds because sometimes the odds were ridiculously low. And, and because it's random, you'd never know whether they were just super low or whether you were just unlucky. Now that they've, now that they've, sh they've shown the odds, now people are like, wow, okay, you know, with, you know, with, with uh, you know, 0.6% chance of getting something, yeah, on average maybe... I'll get something after 150 draws, but there's no guarantee I could get something even within 300 draws. So by putting a guarantee, then at least there's some sort of fixed value instead of it being completely random whether you get value. I mean, I talk about this in uh, my article on how the ESRB was promoting children's gambling. And I talked about how if you sent your kid to the market to buy a loaf of bread, and to buy a loaf of bread, they had to... to to, to spin on a roulette wheel to see whether they actually got the loaf of bread. You know, and your kid can come back crying after having spent $20 and they didn't get the loaf of bread because the store wouldn't give it to them because they didn't win it on the roulette wheel. I mean, and, and no, no adult would allow their child to be subjected to that in a store, but, but they don't know about it and they just seem to be okay with it in games. I just a picture like a dystopian story that's just like all center on light becoming about loot boxes and gotchas now. <laughs> Everything must be rolled. Well, why is it okay in games and not okay elsewhere? Yeah. And because you have dystopian leaders who are quite intentionally creating this dystopia for us. And again, it's this, uh, it's this competitive attitude towards gamers where they see the, as, as, us as their players as an adversary to abuse until and use all these mind tricks on us. They're just being upfront with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a quick kind of some of a tangent, I wanted to get 
I wanted to ask you, when we last spoke, like at the start of this year, I know we were both looking at uh, kind of that loot box law that the United States was preparing. And then, of course, the pandemic hit, and that just, you know, sculled everything for the rest of this year. Has, has there been any movement or any discussions about that that you've heard on, like, on your side? Well, well, I mean, you have to realize, up to at least now, in the political climate in the United States, it's been extremely, I mean, unpre- unprecedentedly anti-regulation. Mm-hmm. Uh, corporations are just, you know, free to run amok uh, and do whatever they want. So any attempts at regulation, all the regulatory bodies have been gutted. So so any any sort of regulation, even if it's makes a lot of sense, is going to have to wait uh, for the for the institutions that would regulate to be rebuilt almost from scratch. Mm-hmm. All right, let me see. And like we were saying, like the whole like loot box model is just very anti-consumer and kind of like what we kind of see from mobile as well. And it's been kind of one of the major points of a lot of our discussions. Um, I guess like to build off that with some of the more modern examples, I think, as you said, like from playing Ark Knights and Genshin Impact, on one hand, they do feel fairer or better compared to some of the examples we've seen previously. But on the other hand, it's still very much not the most consumer-friendly model for video games. Well, I mean, you, the, you at least are starting to post odds, and, mm-hmm. and that's just because of regulatory efforts coming out of uh, primarily Europe and also in Asia. Uh, and, and for these developers that want to publish their games worldwide, uh, even if they wouldn't have to do that in the United States, they, they do it anyways because they want to be able to to sell their games to people in Europe, uh, if they're English localized. Yeah. So, uh, so that's 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 where you're seeing the, these positive movements. Uh, it's not coming from the United States. Uh, we're mm-hmm. basically like dead last as far as mm-hmm. taking care of our consumers. But uh, you know, these are all positive changes. And and I think as a as a player, when you can see and just do the rough math and say, oh, okay, they're selling these characters for five hundred, a thousand, two thousand dollars, then you start to think, oh, is that really worth it to me? Yeah. And and a lot of times they're they're not. So uh even though the games are getting a lot more polished and uh, a lot more sophisticated, uh yeah. I don't think you're necessarily seeing a, a much increase in spending because players are like, oh, this doesn't look like a good idea. Yeah, and that's the thing that I know is especially over the last uh, five six months of playing some of the newer mobile games is that production values have you know grown in leaps and bounds compared to five mm. six years ago. Again, stuff like Ark Knight. Uh, there's one based off the uh, property Seven Deadly Sins. Like just like pick like any new or upcoming mobile game, and you know if you weren't if you know you were looking at this on Google Play Store or the App Store, it looks very much like a console or almost like a current gen game right, that we would play on the PC or console. But once you get into it, and I think this is kind of like that risk that we see, that yes, they are more complicated, yet they're more in-depth, but they're still tethered to the same monetization systems, the same kind of you know tricks and tactics used to get people to spend money. Another game that I tried was uh, Exos Heroes is another one that's kind of like making the trends. And within like 30 minutes of playing it, I'm being bombarded by, you know, pages of different currency I have to worry about, no idea, you know, what any of these characters are actually doing, and it just felt like, do I even want to try and learn this game? Like, is there even any reason for me to spend money if I have no idea what's going on in it? Well, I mean, I look at games like uh, Plarium's Raid Shadow Legends, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, where they've used uh, they have photorealistic uh, animation based on motion capture that just looks amazing. And I look at that and I go, wow, you know, mm-hmm. I could make so much money with my designs if I had, like, you know, content of that quality to go along with them. And I think, wow, you know, what a waste that they put all the, that production work into uh, such a, you know, a weak or antiquated uh, Excel spreadsheet monetization model. Uh, 
I mean, I'm sure it makes money, but uh, it just seemed to me like such a waste because they're just there's so much potential there to make some really cool stuff, uh, and they're just uh, the the meta game design that should go along with that is is moving at a snail's pace, whereas the production quality is is just skyrocketing. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I did finally try Raid Shadow Legends. I think a month, maybe a little bit over that a month ago and yeah like it looks really impressive and then i played it and it just felt like every other kind of rpg turn-based mobile game that i've seen or i've tried you know over the last few years yeah well it's because it is it's the yeah. same it's pretty much the same excel spreadsheet it's just with a higher production value on it yeah, and one of the things I I'm not sure we talked about this specifically, but I want to get your thoughts on this in terms of marketing. That there's a very nasty trend I've been seeing, both in terms of like mobile and even just like on like just advertisements of people advertising mobile games with like just completely false. Oh footage. wow! Oh, I see where you're going. Yeah. Oh, I looked at some of these just ads for stuff, and it's like that's not in the game at all. Yeah. Like, Look at looking at ads for like uh, 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 State of Survival. I'm like, wow, that stuff isn't even in the game. Not even like close, remotely in the game. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, is that legal? I mean, you know, they're in they're 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 based in the United States, so yes, yeah, so everything is legal in the United States if it's <laughs> coming from a business, pretty much. But uh, I mean, it's just so inappropriate. Uh, and I, and when I look on the App Store and I look through games and look at their their just the the pictures they have for the game uh, i i can tell very quickly that whatever i'm looking at isn't even in the game that that, that i'm reading about yeah uh, and they don't care it's, they, they don't even have to, to there doesn't have to be any truth at all yeah and we'll get to shark's comment in a second and like the other thing that i know is like i see like youtubers make sponsored pieces about these games and you know they talk about something like they're you know sp they're uh unbiased review of these games like it makes like no damn sense how they try to describe these games and try and make it sound like it's a fun game and you know come and spend your money on these titles well i mean you, most of their viewers are not unbiased they're getting some sort of uh, oh yes reward for whatever they're saying yeah. and i have to say like for like people watching i've yet to get a raid shadow legends promotion i think they must have seen our discussions and know they must have me flag as, don't try to send this guy a sponsorship deal. He's not going to work for it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, oh. I mean, when I, when I was writing for Unknown Player between 2001 and 2005, uh, I, 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 I'd had some incredibly in-depth reviews. I mean, people would go, you know, and they'd read other reviews that were based on a few hours play. And then they'd come to me and I'd, be, I, like, I'd have a 200-hour guarantee. I would not post a review of an MMO until I played the game at least 200 hours. So there was no comparison between the quality of my reviews and other reviews that were out there. Mm -hmm. But we weren't getting paid. And that's why I was able to do that. Because mm -hmm. if we were getting paid, uh, they'd pull the plug on us if I went into that type of death in my review. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And speaking about reviews, this is what Shark's comment was that, like, with some of the Rage Shadow Legends, they have a five star scroll. But a uh, five star score, but when he looked at it, like he rarely saw anything over three stars in terms of its review. Like the reviews for some of these games seem very suspect to me. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's not like the Steam Store. Even the Steam Store can get pretty suspect. But uh, you know, if you, they only show you a few reviews, and they seem like they're carefully cultivated to to promote the the game. Um, and and. And when I read them, you, know, you can tell it's, you, know, you can tell when it, it's yeah. an honest review and when it's, a, no, no, it's not an honest review. I mean, they mm -hmm. just say, oh, this is the greatest thing, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But they don't actually go into any detail as to why it's great. Then, you know, it's just, it's not a helpful review at best. Yeah. Um, it's the same thing with it on Steam. You're reading a review. If they just say, oh, I really enjoyed this game. Okay, great. But the, the useful reviews are the ones that go into the game mechanics and tell you what's good and what's bad. And then that helps you make a decide decide as whether that does the game for you. Mm -hmm. 
and you don't see that on the on the mobile stores. The reviews are very short generally and 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 very vague. Oh yes. And like another thing that like speaking about like Steam reviews, like one of the things that we saw Valve implement was it's not only current reviews but lifetime reviews. And mm. with uh, the mobile scene, I think getting to like what Shark's on about with very rarely finding reviews above three stars these days that it, I do wonder like how much like weight do these stars really have in terms of the algorithm like if a game gets a bunch of five stars immediately and then gets you know lots of one and two stars later does it still count as having a five star review because I can't even imagine how many reviews Raid Shadow Legends must have at this point being out for so long well, I mean, uh, Raid Shadow Legends will prompt me for a review, but it, it waited quite some time to make sure that, that I was, you know, uh, uh, their type of player, that, you know, that I was, that they, their algorithm decided that I was enjoying their game. And that's when they asked for the review. Uh, they would not, you know, and that way that they have, they're creating a bias where they're promoting reviews mm -hmm. from people who are enjoying the game and not getting reviews from people who just stop playing right away. And so that's inherent bias right there. Yeah. And we see many mobile games will have like targeted ads or target promotions explicitly after you do, you know, you pull a rare character or you do something impressive. I remember with uh, Marvel's Contest of Champions that literally every time you pull anything four star or higher, the game creates an ad or it creates a limited time purchase for you, you know, a second after you make that pull. Well, in in my widely read and translated uh, top secrets of free to play uh, gaming, uh, um, or I don't know the exact title of the article now, but the um, uh, I mentioned that that even in that year, it was standard practice for games to adjust to what they were going to offer you based on how you were you were playing, and uh, I got I got attacked. I, uh, Gama Sutra. And myself, but I but in the, the Gama Sutra had the lawyers from King came down on them and told them to pull that because they said they don't do that. And my response was that is that th this is industry standard. If King's admitting that they're not doing it, then they're admitting that they're behind even the industry standard about doing this. And I'd be quite shocked. And uh, I didn't pull the article. And and then I showed later within a year or so that they were bragging about having bought a company that this is the service they provided, that they could help adjust sales based on uh, in-game metrics. Mm -hmm. So they caught up, and now they were doing what, I, what they were claiming they weren't doing, and they were upset that I had said that they were doing. Mm. Yeah, like the closest I've gotten to that was when I made a post talking about key resellers and stuff like, um, I always forget their name, the big one that's always in the news i got in trouble uh, oh yeah i know who you're talking about yeah i don't remember the name either yeah and uh, they actually one of their representatives actually got in touch with me through medium asking me to make changes to the article saying oh we never did this that's just a lie and i didn't do it and i just like blocked the person after that yeah i don't know my article actually gained more credibility and was even more widely read because of the attack by King uh, and the threats by King, which I posted in the article. I added them to the article because uh, I mean, if, if uh, King wouldn't f feel threatened or even respond to me unless that article was being read a lot, and it was, it was very widely circulating. Yeah, and I'm noticing that with a lot of the stuff that I'm getting on Medium too that I've been posting that. It's again, I think, a little bit more of a reach there. I think that's how they found that piece. And, yeah, it's, again, like, the stuff that we talk about, many people don't really think about, or at least from the consumer standpoint, about what it means to play these games or these kinds of tricks. Um, the whole loot box thing. I've, I, I've gotten attacked by people on Gamma Sutra saying, I don't know what I'm talking about or it's perfectly fair. Somebody once tried to argue with me that, you know, like, loot boxes are the same as killing, getting loot in Diablo, which that just, like, I had to go and I ran about that when someone tried to say that to me. 
Well, I mean, when this is how you make your money, uh, mm -hmm. you don't like people shining light on that. And you're going to be trying to silence them if they shine a, a light on you. And if you're sophisticated like you are, then you can counter those fairly weak arguments and say, no, the, those two things aren't analogous. <laughs> yeah, but I've had to defend myself because I made a negative review about Spelunky 2, the uh, current <laughs> big name game that I got a lot of attacks for, saying that wasn't the best. <laughs> yep. Now, uh, as a quick time check, we are about an hour and 20 in. I'm trying to think. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit more about what you're currently working on, you know, for people mm -hmm. watching. Anything else regarding, like, any other, like, mobile-related topics we haven't touched on that uh, you'd like to go into discussion about? Well, I mean, if we, if we just uh, uh, go back to the fact, to, the, to, to my key point that what's really would drive monetization of these games would be pure effects mm -hmm. and maybe talk a little bit more about what those are okay. and that would be a great segue into what i'm building now because it's all about pure effects all right so i mean uh, i mean like the example i often use is 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 people don't uh people don't buy a ferrari to drive down the street at 240 kilometers per hour or 160 miles per hour or so if you're in the United States and, and haven't switched to metric yet. Um, uh, you know, a person will, will buy a, a Ferrari to drive 10 miles an hour down the street and have everyone stare at them because they can't. You know, it, it's what I call peacocking attacks. People will, will stop and look at you. Yeah, you, so the other guy might have a really fancy Corvette that can go just as fast, but it's not as cool. They're going to be looking at your car. And that's, that's the type of thing you want. And people want to, to get that type of attention. They want to be seen as cool. They want to be featured on videos. They want people to want to hang out with them because they think they're cool because of what they got. So, and, 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 it's, and it's less cool if, if you didn't earn it. I mean, if, if, not so much in real life because, you know, real life doesn't have the same sort of rules that games do. But in a game, if, if they know that you actually had to work to get something as opposed to just spending money, then, that, mm -hmm. that, then it's 10 times cooler. Yeah. Oh, yeah so so try, trying to put this into a game uh, such that, one, you're, if people can show off their coolness, and two, that they can spend money on the coolness without it becoming uncool is a very complicated design challenge. Uh, because it, it I, I, on the surface, it looks like it's an impossible challenge. It looks like it would be impossible to get people to spend money, but not lose the, you know, but not lose the coolness factor at the same time. It is possible, but how it can be done is, is, well, I mean, obviously, it's it's the result of years of work on my part, and uh, blockchain is uh, a nice addition to that whole suite of design uh, elements because with blockchain, now you can have an environment where people can sell their stuff anytime you want. You can allow people to sell their stuff anytime they want. And you can, you can allow assets that are of extremely high value. In the, in the current business model I have for Cloudwalker, uh, I... I have the, the top asset in that game. Uh, I estimate that it will sell after about two years after the game will launch. Uh, it will sell each one, and there's more than one. Each one will sell for between one and a half and two million dollars. <laughs> and, and you think, why? Well, you think, well, why would you, somebody, it, it, that, you know, your first reaction would be, that's completely impossible. Because there's nothing I could make in a game that would be worth a million dollars. Um, and, you know, and just because I say, oh, this is a million dollars, uh, people aren't going to buy it for a million dollars. I'm talking about something that will go on market, on auction, and not sold by me, but sold by another player, that will sell to another player, not me, for over a million dollars. I don't get paid. I don't, I don't get any of that. Mm-hmm. So, 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 so this isn't about me trying to sell something for a million dollars. This is me creating something with enough value in a game 
that players will value it between each other mm -hmm. at over a million dollars. And when that item sells, more than half of that will go to all the people that helped create that item. And part of the reason it's so valuable is it would take about 100 players two years to make that item working mm -hmm. together. And so what you're really paying for is 200 man years of game labor. <laughs> and, and that's what makes it that valuable. And that's how 100 people could make money and in some some countries maybe even a living wage just playing a game for two years hmm. now uh what was the term you use for kind of like good uh monetization purchases again a good monetization oh you, you said a term like for the topic what was that uh peak i forget what you were using not oh, peacock. peacocking 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 see the uh, Peacocking is a way of showing off something cool. If, if, if I'm playing Arknights and I have a bunch of six-star uh, operatives, uh, no one cares because no one's seeing me use them. Mm -hmm. so, and maybe if they did, they did, still wouldn't care because it doesn't affect them in any way. Uh, so but what like, if I'm on a team, especially mm -hmm. a large team? Because I mean, so you got to realize I come from, uh, I was in, you, you know, I was in team sports before I got into gaming. I, I didn't even get into gaming until I was in my, as an industry, until I was in my mid-30s. Before that, I was in elite and Olympic level uh, sport. And uh, so coaching on, at that level, I, I really had to understand what makes a team effective in order to make, you know, to, to bring value to the world's best teams. And, I, and I, so I'm, I'm, I'm coming from that viewpoint when I come into gaming, where I'm, again, I'm trying to build team sports where uh, you don't have all this toxicity and where the gameplay is fair and people will work very hard in order to be the best, but actually earn it. Mm -hmm. And I guess one thing I want to ask you about like, with like, your example and what you're working with your games, as we've said over the course of this discussion, a lot of microtransactions are designed to either punish the player for not spending it or, you know, guilt tripping them into spending it. You know, as we say, the whole paying for power in PvP, paying for it in a guild. How are you, I guess, or have you thought about how are you avoiding, like, that kind of toxicity with the games that you're making? Well, I do want to, to sell things to people that they will think are valuable. I mean, I... I, I uh, I have no problem selling something for a thousand dollars in in Cloudwalker, but what I would be selling wouldn't be something that's immediately all that useful. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would sell would be something that I might call like a uh, some I for it internally as a symbiote, but it's but it's it's something that that you have to put a lot of work into, and 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 skill based work. And eventually, it'll transform into something else that's much more useful and much more rare. Mm. Or it can be combined with something else <clears throat> to make something much more useful or rare or powerful. Mm. And that way, it mitigates the pay-to-win stench uh, because it still took a lot of work to develop it. And it also means that you know that, that it's going to be very rare because most, pe most people, you know, won't have the patience to do that. But this, is for, this isn't for the rich player. This is for the super hardcore player that can then take that item, turn it around, and sell it possibly to someone else for quite a bit more than they originally paid for it. And because you're really charging for their labor. They're charging for their expertise. And I'm assuming that you're not going to have any kind of, like, skips in the game. Like, it's not like I can spend X amount of money and then, you know, I don't have to work for this product. I just automatically get it. Like, you actually have to put in the time, the labor for it? No skips. It, it, the things I would sell you would make you have to work even harder <laughs> to progress. But then at the end, you end up with something cool that no one else has. Or, or very few people will have. And... And the only things I allow players to sell between uh, to other players are these kind of really super rare goodies, hmm. things yeah. that they really had to work hard for in order to sell to another player. Speaking but of that way, they'll be able to get uh, a fair amount of money for it. 
Hmm. Speaking about that kind of, you know, putting the work in to get something rare. One game I didn't ask, I didn't like ask you to try out, but I want, uh, now I kind of wish I did. Did you ever play Warframe by any chance? Oh, you know, I, I kind of played like in the beta when it, for, before, you know, when it was in beta. I don't think I've really played it, played it since then. I know it's, it's, it's gotten quite a lot of good positive views for content that's been added post, post launch, but I haven't okay. gone back to check it out. The reason why I bring it up is that one of the things that they do that I think is very uh, ingenious about it is that while you can certainly spend money to get a, a new Warframe or get a new gun, a lot of that is about crafting, and they use like real time, uh, real time values for the crafting system. That if you want that really powerful Warframe, you're going to need to find you know, all the various parts for it, build it, and then it's yours to keep. And like you said, like what we've been like discussing, that when the player feels like they accomplish something, it gives, I think, more of an inherent value as opposed to just saying, here's $1,000, give me my, you know, fancy helmet or my fancy suit. No, absolutely. But does Warframe let them sell that thing they've made after they made it? I don't think so. I think it's still just a one, you know, one way kind of shop. See, you know, if, if somebody can put a lot of work into something like that and then sell it, mm -hmm. don't you think that would be motiv motivation for them to do that because they could actually make some real money for being that good a player? Mm -hmm. uh, Shark ass and check, uh, symbiotes seem like a cool thing. Do you have any examples of that in a card game? Hmm. In a what game? In a, in a card game or a deck builder? I, I did. If he's asking me if I did this in Gods and Chains, then the answer is no. Oh, I think you kind of broke out there and hear the answer. <laughs> if if he's if he's asking me if I did something like that in Gods Unchained, then the answer is no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and I can't really talk about what I did at Immutable. So, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but other than that, what's public knowledge? Uh. For the game that you're working on now, what was the name of it for, for people watching us? Cloudwalker. Cloudwalker. So it sounds very much, as you said, a game that the whole idea of player-to-player -player, uh, transactions is going to be a very integral part of it. And like we've said, it is a very big difference compared not just to free-to-play games, but to pretty much a lot of titles out there. And as we said, like the only game that I can think of that does something along those lines, or at least in some scale, would be something like Second Life. Well, I mean, most games figure that they're going to get most of the money they're going to get out of you in the first week or two. Mm -hmm. And you, you, know, you know, in my, my Whales Don't Swim in the Desert paper, I talk about how it takes 18 or 19 days before a whale spends their first dollar. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to get the whales, you have to give them... Uh, you have to prove to them that you have substantial long-term content that could make this their new ride, uh, you know, their new game of choice. And and here in, in Cloudwalker, I'm not aiming at the to make money off you in the first two weeks. In fact, I, there's almost nothing you can spend money on in the first two weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, almost nothing. I mean, you could there's a few things maybe you could buy from other players, but but not much uh, of value. Most of what I'm selling is content that you won't even reach for the first year or two. Uh, and so this is the type of game where I would expect monetization to start off very low and then get astronomical after a year or two. Uh, it's a complete reverse of common uh, monetization philosophy. Uh, oh, and Charles, if there were any examples, right? Uh either real or not of that in a uh, CCG like our <laughs> game. Because <laughs> he's working on a Neon Continuum and he's trying to get some notes and people from you. <laughs> well, I mean, Magic Gathering made a lot of, uh, you know, had some cards that, are, that ended up being quite valuable. Uh, partly because they're quite rare. Uh, mm -hmm. But also because they were quite powerful. Uh, and we did our best to, to, to mirror that model uh, to a fair extent in Gods Unchained, where uh, the unique cards, where 
there actually was literally just one of those cards sold for like sixty thousand mm. dollars between the players and again like the challenge of course of this is the fact that, as you say if it's player if it's player to player transactions they're the ones who are kind of dictating you know mm -hmm. what this price is going to be and i guess like with uh cloud runner are you doing Cl a cloud cloud walker cloud walker i'm sorry uh well, cloud walker <laughs> I, I got it was off. I was uh, running. It's walking there. <laughs> uh, Cloud Walker, like, do you? Is there any information in the game, or do you give the player information about how to price things, or you know, like, do they have any idea of like how the economy works, or is it all going to be on them to figure this out? I give them some clues uh, in the form of you know, I may be selling them something that then I'm expecting them to transform and then resell later. So obviously they're going to want to sell it for more than they bought it for. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a clue. But other than that, I don't, I don't, it's really going to be just based on what's the availability. Uh, there are some things that, that players will not want to sell because they're quite valuable to them. Mm -hmm. But if they do sell them, other players will likely buy them at an extreme premium because you you would have to sacrifice your own progression in order to sell those things. Um, so I wouldn't expect there to be a whole lot of those things being sold. And when they did, I would expect the prices to be very high, which is fantastic for the players. And also looks good for me to show off just how much stuff sells for in my mm -hmm. game between players. Um, the, the threat there is bots trying to undermine that and take advantage of that market because bot doesn't care about their progression or future success. They just... And so you would normally think that would be a real threat, but just this week I, I figured out a way that I think finally after 15 years to completely eliminate bots from my design. So I'm really excited about that. Nice. That'll probably be a discussion for another time as well, but we could get into a lot on that. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not going to be sharing that for a while because that's a super top secret. All right. So besides selling players, you know, the equipment and materials they need to do stuff. Are you going to have like personalization options? Again, the whole peacocking, you know, you exclusive skins, exclusive, you know, clothing, etc. Well, this is a subject of internal debate. I, <laughs> I've got to be careful about that because, like, if I have five five creatures and they all look different, I'm going to want to be able to give to have those differences be a clue to the other person as to what they're fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could just reskin it, then, then that hides what their actual characteristics of the critter are. So I, I, I'm, I'm losing some of my, some of my options there in, in game design. Uh, if I allow some things like combat against to be reskinned. Mm -hmm. So probably not going to allow that sort of thing, but, um, I do give options as far as like um, the, the, your entire. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, it's probably too too early to sh to, to share this, but I, I let you basically grow your entire environment, what I call a biome, and uh, and you can customize that a lot, especially over the two years. And and it's not just cosmetic. When you change your biome, it affects everything you do in that biome including the creatures you recruit or, or uh, uh, the teams you can build. Okay. In terms of the actual gameplay loop itself, is there anything you go into detail about regarding Cloud Walker now, or is it still too early in development? Generally, uh, uh, Cloud Walker is about uh, you going into... Uh, into the cloud, the AI has, as uh, an AI has come in and, and there's, there's a, there's a virtual space that was created by scientists and something happened and the AI, an AI came in and corrupted it. And you're going in like as explorers to find out what happened to the first team. And mm -hmm. as a result, and, and, and in, in a way, the AI is like playing games with you and you're trying, you land here hoping it would be like this utopia, but you're actually in a hostile environment and you're trying to survive. Um, 
the AI is not necessarily trying to like eliminate you, but it's testing you. And you need to uh, uh, work with nature in this new in this new world. And if you're successful, uh, then the biome that you're in actually transforms into a more advanced biome. And new th new options become available. New creatures become available. Uh, new playing arenas become available. And 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 this is a completely a team based game. You will not be successful. You may not even survive. I may mean, literally just kill off players who are not mm -hmm. successful in 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 team play. Uh, in in progressing because the AI is testing you. And uh, and so the teams will initially start off as like. I'm aiming at for the smallest initial teams being 15. You'll know everyone on your team and everyone has to cooperate like naked and unafraid, but like with 15 people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and eventually as you progress through the game, uh, this can reach 150 players on a team. Uh, again, everyone cooperating together to, to, to both survive and build the stuff that they want. So it's 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 designed to be hyper social, hyper peacocking, uh, play to earn, uh, fully tradable. Uh, it, it's it's basically I'm trying to make the Tesla of games where it's it's, it's just a really an ultra premium experience that's very long term. And in theory, we could just keep building on this game forever. Mm. And speaking about kind of keeping players invested in it, I guess. Are there any things that you're doing to avoid kind of... We talked about this before with regards to making the game that forces somebody to play it and, you know, the kind of mental stress that gets put on them because of that. Are you doing anything in Cloudwalker to kind of avoid that or minimize it? Well, I, I'm, I'm minimizing the amount of hours per day they have to play okay. because I don't want them to have to choose between a real life and the game. So it's, it's not about the grind. But... I, I would say they will have to participate every day or they could hurt their team. Just like uh, when I was in team sports mm -hmm. for over a decade. Uh, it, if I was competing and I, I got hit by a bus once, uh, literally, um, and I was on the sidewalk when I got hit, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and I was out of action for a couple of weeks, but I still showed up to practice every day. It doesn't matter what happens unless you're in the hospital. You show up to practice every day, even if you can't, you can't compete that uh, or train that day. And that's, that's the team spirit. And that's uh, the kind of feeling I want to build also in the game where even if you, you know, your, your ability to participate will be limited a day, you still show up. Because you're part of a team. Yeah. All right. Um, and you're guess... possibly making money while you're playing. Yeah, that's certainly true as well. And with Cloudwalker, it sounds like there will be the opportunity for people to make money with it, obviously. Oh, we're totally trying to, to make that a key, key element of the game. Play to earn is going to be very key. All right. So in terms of, I guess, logistics, anything regarding, like, do you have an estimated time for when people will be able to check it out? Well, I mean, a lot of this depends on and how things go with uh, the investors and such. So we're still on that stage where we're raising funds. So I, I can't give any numbers okay. on time frame yet. But I think we'll be able to do it fairly quickly because I'm not trying to design something that's overly complex from a production standpoint. All right. Is there anything else regarding Cloudwalker that we didn't discuss that you would like to bring up now? No, I just hope it becomes a, you know, I, I, I expect it to be copied and I hope it gets copied because I, I would like mm -hmm. to see, uh, uh, you know, us move away from the era of Excel spreadsheet games uh, that are very isolating and have a lot of fun pain and such and gambling mechanics and, and just move towards games that, that mirror real life better, but, but, but better than real life. All right. Definitely best of luck with that. So... Uh, to end the cast on then, any final thoughts on mobile monetization in general? You know, anything at all to kind of end on? Well, I mean, unless in, until we get past the area of data-driven design and allow developers to start innovating again, we're not going to see innovation. 
most of the innovation right now you're seeing is in the indie space coming from very small development teams of like a dozen most people, mm-hmm. mostly on Steam. Uh, the only other innovation you're seeing is basically on the is the is the production quality. You know, graphics are are advancing, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but even then you're not seeing that translate into more players. Uh, we had bigger we had bigger games back in when we were playing EverQuest or World of Warcraft or Shattered Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the team sizes have gotten smaller over time, not bigger, and that that just boggles my mind because that seems would be seem to be the one thing you'd want us to apply your technology to. All right. Well, yeah, definitely a lot of great discussions tonight, and hopefully, you know, we can speak again. <laughs> In less time, maybe the world will be in a better place by the time of our next discussion. Yeah, I feel bad for you. I'm I'm pretty safe over here in Australia. Uh, and I worry a lot about my friends and family in the state. Yeah, uh, we were just talking about this before we started the stream. That like for us gamers, like this isn't you know anything new. We've been isolating for a long time. Yeah, I have at least two family members who have gotten COVID so mm. far. So uh, it's it, it's real for me. Yeah. Uh, uh, hopefully things will improve and I hope to hear good things about Cloud Walker in the future thank you I'm very excited about it alright uh, to end the cast you have anything uh, social media or any sites people can check things out with um, well I mean you can always find me on LinkedIn uh, uh, I'm not writing so much for Game Thomas Sutra these days because they, I don't have the freedom to write everything I want to over there mm-hmm. Uh but as soon as I have more to, to put out about Cloud, Cloud Rocker, I will definitely put it out and let you know. All right. Well, uh, Ramin, as always, it's been a pleasure hanging out with you. It's my evening. I know you're, I think you're definitely ahead of me right now. So I'm not sure what time it is for you at this moment. Oh, yeah, it's actually like noon or one o'clock, I think, here. All right. Well, uh, as always, thank you so much for coming on. And yeah, uh, let's uh, schedule do something like this again in the future. My pleasure. And it was always good hanging out with you. (laughs) All right. And hopefully we have you back on for one of our roundtable talks as well in the future, too, if you ever have more free time. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've been kind of a recluse. I've really been working hard on this blockchain thing the last year. All right. Well, again, it it sounds very interesting. And definitely curious to see where things go with Cloudwalker and kind of like that whole ultra premium model. All right. Well, uh, folks, we're going to end things here for this discussion. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're new, be sure, as always, to check out the Discord and Patreon link down below. If you are a developer working on a game or teaching design or just want to come on talk about video games with me, please reach out and get in touch. You can follow me on Twitter at GWBicer. I know for you, Ramin, you don't do too much in terms of social media other than through LinkedIn. I keep a low profile since I got death threats in 2001 with my home address on it. But uh, again, we will hopefully be able to have you back on in the future. And maybe you have a great rest of your afternoon and well, I guess for the evening for everyone else watching. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, with that said, folks, we're going to end things here. So come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we're in the art and science of games. Until next time, take care.